Hello, uh, here we are, here we are back. So first of all, I wish everybody a very happy new year. Hopefully this 2021 will be much better than 2020. And uh, hopefully the current uh, global pandemia, uh, well, we will be able to overcome it as soon as possible. Okay, so we are back to the videos of cosmology on my first video back in December. Essentially, I described what was understood by cosmology on the old time, and by old time, so we were referring to, to the Babylonian, uh, the Hindus, and uh, the Greek, the old uh, ancient Greece, and also how was uh, the universe understood uh, for the Arabs up to the 13th uh, century, roughly. On um, this second video, we will start with what we truly understand as science nowadays, so, uh, and by this, what I mean are scientists that described by the tool they had at the time, the movement of the planet. So essentially this video will go from uh, Copernicus till, uh, till Kepler. So um, roughly what I'm uh, what we'll be describing will go from the end of the 15th century till roughly uh, 16th, 17th century. Okay, so uh, let's, let's start. So I will put now the slides. Okay, so just one moment. Okay. So I will go from Copernicus to Kaplan. So I remind you, my name is Marie Muhammadi Lopez, and I'm a researcher at Ikerbask, which is the Basque Foundation for Science, and I'm also a lecturer at the University of the Basque Country, okay, in Spain. So from Copernicus to Kaplan. So we will start uh, with Nicolai Copernicus, who was born in uh, 1473 and passed away 1543. So he was a Polish mathematician and astronomer, among other things at the time. So the, the scientists used to uh, not only be scientists, they, they, they used to uh, learn uh, other things and work in other things as well. So that's why I wrote among other things. So why Copernicus was so important? So essentially, at that time, the model that was prevalent was this one in which essentially uh, people believed that the Earth was at the center. Well, it was the planet, including the sun, that uh, well uh, rotates around the, the earth so somehow the earth was in some um, privileged place but then he realized thanks to the measurement he did that well in fact it's the sun that should be at the center while the rest of the planets are the ones that are rotating around the sun okay how did he conclude that so essentially he made some measurements measurement of mercury venus mars jupiter and saturn and uh, well, what he realized that the description, okay, well, the sun is at the center, then Mercury, then Venus, then the Earth where we are, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. This structure so was much better, much easier to describe the observation referring to Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Okay, so this is what he realized. The idea, I mean, this model was already um, present on the Greek, on the old Greek period. What uh, Copernicus had was that the measurements they had at that time, okay, they explained much better, they were explained much better through an heliocentrism system, okay, rather by, than by putting the earth at the center. Okay, and the rest of the uh, elements rotating around the Earth. He also uh, observed the occultation of Al-Dilbaran, which is the brightest star in the constellation of Taurus, by the Moon. What does it mean, this occultation? So essentially, so we are on the Earth, we have the Sun. So imagine at some point we have the Moon here, okay? And the star is roughly here, okay? So what he realized that, well, he observed is that because the moon was in between the, the, the I would say, the, the, uh, the line between the earth and al Biraban, then, uh, well, the moon was hidden, okay? Well, uh, after years and years and years of work, so he, uh, um, summarize all his work on a book entitled on the revolution of the heavenly spheres okay 
the heavenly spheres were referring essentially to those ideas that, well, the uh, earth was at the center, while the rest of the earth had to do strange movement along those sphere. So, but here, what he uh, showed was that through those measurements, this model, an heliocentric model, where the sun is at the center, while the rest of the planets are those that are rotating around the sun, is much better in order to explain the observation. Okay. His book was published shortly after his, his death, the same year of his death, but shortly after. And uh, well, he was not very convinced of publishing this, this book, but at the end he did it, which was uh, good. Um, he was not, uh, from what I read, he was not fully convinced of publishing because everybody, almost everybody believed, of course the church included, that this model, placing the earth at the center was the correct one, even though it was the wrong one. Now, Copernicus' uh, work implied the revolutionary idea because essentially he brought uh, the, the, this heliocentric model based on observations, okay? So then that answer, he was revolutionary model. So the earth was not in any special favorite position or central. Mm -hmm. And the solar system, this one here, is described by an heliocentric model. What does that mean? It means essentially the sun, I repeat, is at the center and the rest of planets, Mercury, the closest one to the sun, then Venus, the Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were uh, rotating around the sun. Here, the idea is uh, that those orbits are circular. We will see by Kepler that, well, this is not truly the case, but step by step. Now, uh, the next astronomer I would like to refer to is Giordano Bruno, who was born on the 16th century and uh, killed in uh, 1600. Okay. So he was an Italian mathematician and astronomer. He was uh, from a region very close to Naples. And again, I put here among other things. So one of those things, uh, Copernico and also Bruno, they were uh, cleric, okay. Um, he extended the Copernican model. So he believed the Copernican model was the correct one. And in spite of that model, he extended it. And how did he extend it? Well, the first thing, the, the sun is a star, okay? And that sun has some planets around it, okay? So why not? Uh, why would, you, would, would this system would be unique? So then he realized, okay, so then aside from the sun, there are other stars. And those stars, like the sun, they have their own planets, okay? So the, he extended the idea, and the uh, solar system, to the possibility that there were other, um, let's call it star system, okay? The other idea that he uh, worked on was that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. What does that mean? So homogeneous means that essentially you sit at a point, okay, and then uh, you can look at objects that are at, uh, let's say, 1,000 kilometers, one parsec, one megaparsec, whatever you wish. Um, no matter at which distance you look at, you will see the same thing. Now, isotropic means that uh, no matter in which direction you observe, you will observe the same thing. So we know, in fact, that nowadays the universe is homogeneous and isotropic on large scales. Okay, we'll be back to that point, uh, well, on the, in the coming videos. He also believed that the universe is infinite in space and in time. Nowadays, we know that there was something called the Big Bang, or very similar to a Big Bang. Therefore, from that period to now, there is a finite time. So the idea of infinite, although nowadays we have some model that in fact, they incorporate the idea that time could be infinite, what we know for sure, based in what we will describe in uh, other videos as the theory of general relativity, is that there was something similar to a Big Bang, something similar to it. And therefore, because that's, happen at a finite time from the present time, so therefore the universe will be finite in time, okay? 
at least from what general relativity predicts. But anyway, for that time, he, uh, of course, uh, brought ideas that are uh, working and well nowadays. So the universe is indeed homogeneous anisotropic on large scale. Now, uh, the other thing he realized is that day and night, as I wrote there, is an effect of the rotation of the Earth around itself. So the Earth, we can see it as a ball, and then we have a much bigger ball here that it is with the Sun. So as the Earth is make a uh, sorry, as the 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 the, uh, the Earth is rotating around itself, and at the same time making a circle, okay around uh, the, uh, the sun, what happened is that when this face, let's call this my, uh, this side of my hand, is looking toward the sun, so this will be the uh, day. Now, as it continues its movement, the two rotation I'm referring to, now this side that now you don't see on the video is the one that would be night, while this side would be day. So essentially, the motion of uh, rotation of the uh, of the um, uh, of the Earth around itself is the one that describes the effects of day and night. Okay, uh, I remind that we have this motion, the Earth around itself, plus the the motion around the the sun. Okay. Now, unfortunately, uh, because of the Inquisition, so uh, essentially the church had other belief, so they didn't believe on the, um, uh, on the uh, Eleusentris uh, model at that time. Uh, so Bruno, because he uh, uh, kept believing that this indeed, uh, the Eleusentris model is the correct one, he was burned at stake, unfortunately, on 17th, uh, 16th, Okay. He was certainly a martyr uh, for science, and uh, he um, he helped and a lot for uh, the uh, evolution and development of science. Okay. Now he came Galileo Galilei. So Galileo Galilei was um, again an astronomer and also a physicist, among other things. Among these other things, he was also an engineer that was very important because he could construct a relatively good telescope, which were very important for observation. He's considered to be uh, the modern, uh, the father of modern physics, and I put for his epoch, I'm not referring here to quantum mechanics or electromagnetism or nothing like, but I'm uh, simply referring to the idea of modern physics for his epoch and the scientific uh, method. So you can have many theories, as many as you wish, but at the end, the theory has to make some prediction and those predictions uh, have to corroborate the observation if the theory is correct. So that's since we have <clears throat> the scientific model and that's essentially what he did. And he is also considered the father of the modern science. Well, he, uh, thanks to those telescopes, let me, uh, well, essentially he heard that there was some um, new telescope in Holland and then he wanted to improve them. And he did. So essentially, he improved them in two ways: one by magnifying the the image, and the other one by getting an upright image. Okay, because depending on the lens, you can have an upright or downright image. Okay, so he observed the the uh, the phases of Venus, which was quite uh, important, and then uh, the satellite of Saturn. Although he was uh, he didn't know that in fact they were the satellites of Saturn. He just observed something close to Saturn. Um, he observed the planet Neptune, okay, although again he didn't know really that he was a planet, he thought it was a very dim star. But yet, so it was uh, still uh, impressive that by the mean they had at that time, he could, he could observe things further than, than Saturn, okay. He also realized some studies of the moon, of, uh, of the tides as well. And then he observed the Milky Way. So essentially he saw that there was some kind of cloud on the, on the sky with uh, a tiny dots, okay? So that was the Milky Way. Then he showed the, that the geocentric model is the correct one. Uh, why? For example, because the phases of Venus uh, could be explained through this geocentric model. The Ptolemaic model and uh, its many version could not 
explain the phases of Venice. Okay. Uh, therefore, uh, the uh, theory that was correct for the universe is the geocentric model. Okay. So he also uh, was very. He was also, of course, very important for uh, for astronomy. Okay, and for cosmology. So Bruno, he was, as I said, very important, uh, Copernico as well, okay? And now let's go to the third one that, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to, to mention before heading to the, uh, describing the, the work of the next uh, scientist. Like, uh, well, Bruno, he was quite unlucky, okay? So let me go back, if you allow me. So despite that he uh, realized that the day and night is an effect simply of the rotation of, of the Earth, okay, around itself, which uh, was also rotating around the Earth, so essentially, as I said, uh, day is this side of the Earth that is facing the Sun, Night is the other one, which was uh, big and huge progress at the time, including ideas very important, the homogeneity, the isotropy of the universe that we know nowadays that indeed it's the case. Because the church was against those ideas, unfortunately Bruno was burnt at the stake. Now, um, Galileo Galilei, he was lucky, but still he was not fully lucky. So again, he was tried by Inquisition and uh, although he was not killed, he was forced to spend the rest of his life at, uh, well, under house arrest. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's uh, quite unfortunate. Now, so far up to Galileo Galilei, they thought that the orbits were circular. Okay, and here comes Johannes Kepler. Himself, Johannes Kepler thought that the orbits were circular. But then, by using the observation that he had at, uh, at hand, he realized, no, they were not circular. So who was Johannes Kepler? Johannes Kepler was a German mathematician and astronomer. And he provided us with three uh, laws. Okay, so the first law of the planetary motion states that the planet moves in elliptical orbit with the sun on a focus. Okay, what does that, this mean? So first of all, let me explain what is an ellipse. So an ellipse is, can be understood, uh, we have a circle. Now, if you stretch the circle, you will get an ellipse. You stretch it correctly, of course, which is what is drawn here, the blue, the blue curve, okay? If you stretch it too much, that will become a line. So somehow, uh, the ellipse can be understood as an interpolation between a line and a circle, okay? You take rugby ball, okay? Let's imagine this rugby ball. If you cut it like this, you will have essentially an ellipse. So this ellipse is characterized with what, what is known as sufosi, sufocus, F1 and F2. And given any point on the, ellip, uh, um, on the ellipse, for example, this point P, so a characteristic of the ellipse is that the distance L1 from the focus one to P plus the distance L2, which is the distance from the point P to the other focus is constant no matter where you have this point P along the ellipse, okay? Now, uh, more things about an ellipse. So it has two foci, as I said, these two foci when the uh, when you get closer, F1 gets closer to F2, until we touch, then we will be back to the case of um, an, um, a sphere, okay? A circle, sorry. Now, uh, it's not symmetric as a sphere, and therefore we have two uh, semi-axes. So the shortest one is called the semi uh, the semi-minor axis, the longest one is the semi-major uh, axis, okay? Now, how does, what does the first Kepler law, <coughs> sorry, tell us about the motion of the planet? So we can imagine this is a planet, for example, the Earth, and the Sun is sitting in one of the books. So what the first uh, Kepler uh, law states is that the Sun is sitting in one of these focus, forces, and the planet, the Earth, in this case, is, or is moving along this ellipse. This means that at some period of the year, we will be closer to the sun, while at other period of the year, we will be much further from the sun, 
Okay, so this is what stayed the first law of Kepler. But I said there are three laws, so there are two more to describe. Second Kepler law, what states is essentially, so as we said, the sun is in one of the focus, it's not in this one. Oops, this one. Then, <clears throat> as the planets move along its orbits, okay, or along, as I wrote here, uh, this ellipse, okay, now uh, we can imagine that, well, we divide uh, the year on um, 12 months, okay? Then essentially this area in blue and this area in, uh, in white is similar. So essentially when you choose the period, so in this case I put the, the month, although we know that some months have uh, 31 days, some months are 30. Essentially this area, when you go from the first day of the month till the last day of the month, will be equal, no matter which months uh, you are using. This is just a symbol to explain things. In fact, what I mean here is essentially if you choose a day or a week, because we know that the month, well, they, they may have 30 or 31 days, or even 28 days, as uh, can be in the case of February. But essentially, the second law of Kepler, what state is that equal area, sorry, is that the planet, uh, once they move, okay, this sweeps out equal areas in equal time. So if you choose here this motion one day or one week or 30 days, this area will be similar if you are on this here and then we, the, the planets make uh, one day, one week or one month, whatever the, the, the uh, time measure you want to choose, okay? This also states that essentially the closer is the planet to the sun, okay, which is in the case of uh, January, essentially, uh, well, the faster the planet move. The further it is from the sun, the slower it, um, it moves, okay? Okay, so let's go to the uh, next slide, to the third law of uh, Kepler. Okay, so the third law of Kepler, what states is that there is a relation between the, uh, the cubic uh, average distance from the planet to the sun and the square of the period. Where the period is essentially the time that the planet takes to make a full orbit around the sun. Okay, so that's what it states. And uh, well, and the relation is linear, okay? So here it's, uh, we can see on this line essentially the period for the different planets, okay? Squared, so the square of the period, while here the cubic distance, distance average to the sun for the different planets. For the case of the Earth is one because it's measured in astronomical units uh, and uh, well, and all these other distance are respect to one. So for example, uh, well, here uh, we are referring to Mars, so it's, it's not 10, but it's almost 10 times the uh, distance to, from the, um, the distance from Mars to the sun is almost not yet, it's almost 10 times the distance from the Earth to uh, the sun, okay? So what he showed was that this cubic distance is uh, proportional to the square of the year, the planet year, which means the period that's taken to make the uh, orbit, the full orbit around the, um, uh, around the sun. And here you can see some measures. So essentially this uh, main um, distance from the sun to the, to the orbit is the semi uh, major axis. So this means essentially, so we are taking one of these uh, distance over here. Okay. Uh, okay. How could he uh, do all this? So essentially what he did was to use the astronomical data of uh, Tycho Brach, who was a Danish astronomer, very, very, very good with observations. So that, uh, that's how he could uh, did use his three laws. So as I said, that the planets uh, rotate around the sun in ellipse, 
uh, that the area that the planet took as he moved on his orbit is essentially the same once you fix the time. So it doesn't matter if we are on the closer to the, let's say, to the sun where you are moving faster. So when you fix that, say, what is the area swapped by uh, during the day would be the same if you are further. Okay, you will move slower, but then that area for the same period of time will be the same. Okay. And then his third law, which essentially relates the cubic of the distance from average distance from the planet to the uh, sun with uh, uh, the square of the uh, year of that planet, which means essentially the square of the period that, uh, that take for the planet to make the, the full circle around the sun. Okay, so uh, so that is it for this video. So we spoke about uh, four important astronomers. Um, uh, we have Copernicus, Bruno, very important uh, as well. Uh, and we continued with um, Galileo Galilei and then John Kepler with, uh, who proved that well, the motion of the planet around the sun follows an ellipse and not a circle. Okay, so all this is, uh, is based on some physical law and it was thanks to Newton, okay, his laws that uh, we will see on the next video, that all these things can be uh, explained. So that's uh, all from my side, okay? And uh, well, I hope you enjoyed the video. If it's the case, please uh, include a like. And uh, well, we will continue on the next month, on February. So for now, bye and see you in February.